Good evening again, everyone. Uh, our session this evening is an excellent, if not necessary, follow-up to our class on freedom two weeks ago. So tonight's talk will help us see freedom in action and its myriad of applications in everyday life. We learned that the essence of freedom is love for the good. How then can we help foster freedom as parents, as educators or grandmothers tasked with accompanying children in their journey to maturity and adulthood? How can we ourselves grow in the spirit of freedom as parents or adults who guide the young? When the environment gets challenging, how can we foster freedom? Is it possible to choose to be free at all times? So we'll try to get answers to these questions tonight. But before that, I'd like to ask Father to kindly start the class. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you for joining us for this Thursday Faith Refresher. Uh, tonight, as Ellen has introduced the topic already, it will be a very interesting topic on applying what we have learned in the past lecture. And um, our speaker um, is with us right now, and he will be introduced later on by our host, by Ellen herself. So to start the class, let's um, pray first to our Blessed Mother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Gabriel, pray for us. Saint Paul, pray for us. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Uh, so, good evening again, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Melissa Lopez Reyes. So, Dr. Mel is a full professor of psychology at the De La Salle University. She has held teaching and research positions at the Iowa State University Department of Psychology, Department of Statistics, Institute for Social and Behavioral Research, and the Office of Pre-Collegiate Programs for the Talented and Gifted, and also at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, Department of Psychology and Department of Mathematics. She was the lead consultant of the DLSU Research on Multi-Context Assessment of Youth Development, the Royal University of Phnom Penh Department of Psychology Research on Cambodian Youth Development, and the Philippine Science High School System Values Education Program. Dr. Mel is married to Dr. Jose Tristan Reyes, and they have five children. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Dr. Mel. Thank you, Ellen, for the kind introduction, and good evening, ladies. Good evening, Father. Let me um, start by sharing the screen My, for tonight's uh, talk. We consider ways of fostering freedom in the upbringing of our children, in ourselves as parents, and adults who accompany the children, and fostering freedom as well in the workplace. So this talk is about the positive sense of freedom. What um, if I may, may call it the freedom to rise to, but there is also that one sense of freedom, which is the freedom to run away from. We need to be freed of anxieties, grudges, memories, broken dreams. So the many varied shackles that we need to be free from. Sin, definitely, given the reality of sin in me, in, in the people around me in the world. So there will always be freedom, meaning the freedom to run away from. But um, this is not the talk about uh, freedom to run away from. This is the talk about freedom to rise to. Growing in freedom in the upbringing of children. In this talk, I thought to focus on older children, that is the youth, and for two reasons. Uh, one reason is what's called the KGOY. Kids get getting older 
younger. So children and preteens are more aware of the world around them. They're more sophisticated than the children a generation ago. Google will yield many explanations of why children grow up too fast. Like they're too young to know what they already know and they are um, quickly losing their innocence. Well, the world has been changing foremost in the modern ways of communication because of the technology we have um, via the internet, travel, um, and all of this conveying various content. So our children are exposed to adult material about maybe foul language, um, different points of view, materials of a sexual content. So that's one. That's why kids grow older, younger. But there's also that they now, early as they are, they feel this pressure to succeed and to perform. So that instead of being carefree, they are stressed. They know the word stress. Some of their parents are described to be hovering and they're also called helicopter parents. Several, several years ago, we would call them stage parents. So with the pressure to succeed come um, a lifestyle of too many extracurricular activities, many hours of study even after they have left school, they go to their tutorial centers and then they study when they get to, when they go home. So young as they are, they already know the words expectations and demands. If this scenario is true, it is sad to think that simple and innocent joys of childhood has been stolen from them. And can they just be kids a little longer? But then again, on the other hand, Sorry. But then again, on the other hand, they're saying that adolescents are taking their time to transition to adulthood much more slowly. So they're taking their time, they're taking it slow. In the year 2000, Arnett has coined the word emerging adulthood to refer to young people ages 18 to 25. And recently, they've upped that age interval to even 29 years old. So these are emerging adults, are those who aren't adolescents anymore, and yet they aren't adults yet. They cannot be considered as adults yet. Well, because they haven't achieved the milestone of adulthood, um, having a stable career, settling down, perhaps getting married, and taking on the responsibilities that come with these adult roles. What emerging adulthood is sent an entirely bad thing because emerging adults have three positive qualities. They're competent, they're internet savvy, they're more, because of this competence, they're more confident compared to younger children. On the other hand, compared to adults, because they haven't settled down yet. And so the many more options and opportunities they have, more than we've had when we were their age, um, they can explore, they can take the, their time exploring because they haven't taken on yet the responsibilities of adulthood. But when they finally settled down or committed themselves to a lifestyle, they are surer of themselves and of the decisions that they have already made. So that was in 2002. Uh, things may have changed now somewhat. So I think in discussing growing in freedom, we need to take a different tack and a positive one instead of KGOY. We'll consider that young people's times today are exciting. So we'll consider freedom to rise to in terms of young people, 
who remain to be hopeful and exuberant in life because there's so much that lies ahead. And even at present, there's so much going on for our children. What's, what's there no, for them to rely on? First are their very selves, their capabilities. Young people take after their creator. So, ang dunong ng mga kabataan ay kahalintulad ng lumikha sa kanila. With their positive qualities, young people can grow and thrive. Like, they know how to plan. They know how to organize. They explore their options and then think about this, make a choice. They're strategic. They're disciplined to attain a goal they have set for themselves. They can problem solve, troubleshoot, and they know how to compensate for their defects or deficits. Um, meron sila niyan. Maniwala kayo. Okay. Maybe they haven't, they have even handled the time of the pandemic with greater optimism than they, that, than we have as adults. While many of us adults were afraid to navigate the internet, the Zoom, online ba banking, online shopping, social media, the youth continued on with their lives during the pandemic. They were running for opposite for positions in student organizations and government. They were organizing webinars, applying for online based jobs holding get-togethers and parties, all of this online. They were learning online, marching in graduation online, and they were unfazed. And now that the world has opened up, they are back sooner than we are. Many of youth's qualities do not develop in a vacuum. Thus, the second thing that they have for them is the environment. Um, the fancy term is ecological assets. But these are support and resources for the, from the people in their family, their school, their communities, no? in society at large, which means social media, the institutions, and youth positive qualities are developed through these resources and support. So when we discuss upbringing of children or growing in freedom in the uh, of our children don't think of um don't think of envisioning them to be who you want them to be rather think of support and resources to harness harness the strengths that they already have will that our youth will find an environment when they feel supported, where there is good teamwork, where they see themselves being engaged in groups and divorce, where they can learn most and contribute most. Also, we need to know, realize that the flow of support is not one directional that we give to the youth. That flow of support also moves from the youth to their environment because there's so much that the youth can contribute to. Thus, the youth's capabilities and the resources and support they get from the environment are building blocks of the freedom to rise to. Freedom to rise to the occasion to do good because the freedom to do good rests on their capabilities. I will present here some keywords, you know, the five C's of positive youth development without um, defining them or elaborating them. But these are things that they need to do the good. Competence, confidence, character, connection, and caring. So with these C's, the youth can be active and engaged citizens contributing to their families and communities. Now, let's concretize the good that the youth can do and the support they need to do the good. Let's consider three scenarios where there is or appears to be the need to run away from, 
when these scenarios actually present opportunities to rise to the occasion to do good. Um, if I may add, relatedly, in the moral life, many situations of running away from sin are actually situations of developing virtues. So scenario one, cheating or creativity. So this is a story that my colleague, uh, Concha de la Cruz, a faculty member of the School of Education, of uh, UANP, we worked together to create a values education program for the Philippine Science High School. And in the chapter on professional ethics, she presented this case. And I read, Ben, Jen, and Wen are members of a group for this week's science laboratory activity. They were only given three days to perform the experiment and complete the write-up. So out of curiosity, they searched online to see if a similar activity had been done. Interestingly, they found a website that reports on the exact experiment. And the author even provided the results and answers to some of the report questions. And the students are asked to think about these questions. And these are a great 10 students. What ending will you give this scenario? Why did you choose that conclusion? The second question we ask them to think about is, imagine that you are the character's friend and they seek your advice regarding their sticky situation. What words of wisdom will you share? How would your advice be taken if this happened in real life? Okay. Um, so this example is very timely and relevant. There's so much learning that happens on the internet and so much uh, cheating and plagiarism and lack of attribution of sources as well. But this passage, which is meant to be a moral dilemma, actually is an opportunity to further one study. Um, in, in the field of science, and these are science high school scholars, they know that they can build a new study. They usually build a new study on, based on results of study already done. And just one needs to say that one just needs to attribute one's sources. So even the simplest, rep doing the experiment again, Replication is a virtue in science. And then they could they can compare the data they've gathered with the data they see on the internet. And that's an additional task they can submit um, as part of the report. Or they can build up on the study because they know the results uh, and think ahead of now I know that I know these results, what else can I do? What open questions can I consider? This experiment has been done already. Let me do something else, building on what they've done already. Of course, um, when the deadline is too tight, I wonder if you can even think of, of these things. Uh, the easy way out is just get the data, copy the report questions, and submit. Problem solved. But, but what for? Um, one excuse may be it's just the deadline is too tight. Um, then offer the information to the teacher. We've seen this on the internet. And negotiate with the teacher. These are what we plan to do. Can you give us more days to come up with the substantive report? So in, in situations like this, we think of not what we can do wrong and be afraid, not even that if, what if I, I, I can't, I know it's wrong, but I think I'm forced to do that. But instead, think of how one can do things better given the situation. So it's to think to do good. And parents, if they're um, consulted, or definitely the, the teacher, would be good to consult the teacher they can support the student's desire to do good. 
Okay. The second scenario, I'll focus more on the support that's given by this persons. So um, I've left out some letters, three letters. Tell me your guess or, or write it on the chat. Okay, siblings. Thank you. Siblings, a support that um, they can get from their siblings is they get it for the rest of their lives. Um, siblings will outlive their parents. Um, siblings will be with them from childhood to adulthood. Would that siblings can become very good friends and the friends of one's brother or sister can also become one's friend. So there's a larger circle of friend of varying ages. Now, a child or a young person is not stuck to being a to friends of the same age only. And siblings protect each other and look out for each other. So it's a natural thing for a sibling to be a chaperone in a date uh, because neither the sibling nor the date won't mind because they're friends. Um, when they're grown, when they've grown and we've left, uh, hopefully, pwede rin silang mag sama na, but hopefully, they will be each other's sucker. So, are siblings meant to quarrel or to compete or to support each other? What can parents, friends, schools, the neighborhood do to support positive sibling relationships? So, the third um, this, this is a two-word phrase to guess is, so this is where um, children and young people get a lot of support and many, um, many fond times and memories as well. Can anyone guess? Dining table. Yeah, dining table. Thank you. So the dining table is not meant to be a pulpit of a church or the discipline office of a school. There's another place and time to admonish and guide our children in private one by one, but not at table. Our children are slowly maturing, slowly but surely maturing intellectually. Naturally, as they learn to reason, they learn to argue. A more positive term for argument is negotiation, dialogue, discussion. And it's perfectly okay. It's a sign of their growing intellectual maturity for children to negotiate and reason it out with their parents. They must feel free to speak their mind to us. Um, they can be combative. They can be angry. Uh, they can feel very self-righteous. Um, they have this very keen sense of injustice. So, mapusok sila. Tayo rin naman nung bata tayo. Well, that too, they have to control their first reactions. No? Um, and to learn diplomacy. And the family is a good training ground for dialogue with others. In the future, your children will dialogue and work with diverse peoples. Um, whose views they do not share, who they are at odds with. To dialogue is the good the children must take on freely. Because children, adults, can just choose to shut themselves off from the world, or they may, or they may choose to dialogue. And they have to know how to do that. So in, in Rudyard Kipling's Poem, if, no? there's this uh, sign of a mature person that he phrased as, if you can talk with crowds, to be comfortable with all sorts of people from all walks of life, and yet be sure of yourself, of what you believe in. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, that starts at the dining table. 
So what I wish to show in these three scenarios are ways by which children can exercise freedom in things that they are convinced about. Honesty in schoolwork, furthering science investigations, um, in the support of being protected and safe in the company of siblings and your friends and friends of siblings, or um, in being competent to dialogue. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the second part, which is, that's us. I accept that. Okay, so we've done growing freedom in the upbringing of children. Now, let's see how we ourselves, as, um, as we accompany our children, can grow in freedom. So, okay. Those my age must have watched the 1989 film Field of Dreams, starring the young Kevin Costner, who played the character of Ray, was a farmer in the Midwest, Midwest United States, and there's this mysterious voice he heard, if you build it, they will come. If you build it, he will come. So despite the economic hardships of farming and being troubled by his lack of achievement, Ray built the baseball field in the middle of the corn field in, in Iowa. Just that knowing that if he built the field, they will come. Who they or for what purpose? He didn't know. And then the field in the middle of the farm became an attraction to peoples from all places and they came. So spoilers alert. He finally came, a young man wanting to play baseball, dreaming to be a great baseball player. So that, that young dashing man is not Kevin Costner. Kevin Costner is the, is the adult one, the older one. So Kevin Costner recognized the person and thought and marveled of how young he was. And Kevin Costner, Ray, the character Ray, approached the young man and Kevin Costner, Ray, said, Dad, would you like to play catch? So Ray met his dad when his dad was much younger and more hopeful than Ray was. At the time when Ray was a struggling and lost adult, albeit he had the support of um, an understanding of his wife. So at the time that Ray was a, a struggling adult, he saw his dad hopeful, wanting to be a professional baseball player, just starting out. In many classes in Introduction to Psychology and Understanding the Self, I had asked students have you ever stopped for a minute, for a moment, to think of your parents, not as parents, but as persons? And hardly anyone would laugh or grimace. It's more like silence. They know, not that they think often about it, that their parents have identities apart from their role as parents. That their parents, too, have their dreams and aspirations to which they have to rise to, are free to rise to, and the children get this. It is good for parents and other adults to accompany, who accompany the young to remind themselves that they have to be free persons first. They have to grow in freedom as they accompany the youth growing in freedom. Many times the parents are trapped in the obligations of parenthood because they see themselves only as parents and have forgotten that they are, in the first place, persons in their own right. Like their children, parents can be trapped by the expectations of others or even expectations of themselves 
as parents. Um, just as how much our children evaluate themselves according to the expectation of their parents, am I worthy? How much do we grade ourselves according to how we think we have brought up our children? In the moral sphere, do we think that a good parent is one whose children hardly ever sin? Or shouldn't it be? Uh, not that our children hardly ever sin, but that they know where to turn to when they have sinned with that hope and certainty that they can begin again. So it's good to remind ourselves that our children are not our report cards, that they are evidence of our good performance as parents. We are not necessarily redeemed by the holiness of our children, and we are not necessarily doomed by their witnesses. Yes, it may be true we have been at fault, whoever haven't been, but as parents of adult children, let's not try to judge ourselves as parents by how our adult children have turned out to be. They may actually be happy, good, God-fearing, but there may be other things that we still look for in them, that we desire for them. Try not to compare your adult children with the adult children of other mothers. In these comparisons, you will just find yourselves either proud, vain, or deeply regretful. So we, on our receiving formation, we're being helped to be better persons. The formation we receive now is so we can better our present and our future and share what we've learned with others. It's not to lead us to beat our breast about some remote forgiven past. What's forgiven don't exist anymore. So many times to be able to rise to the good, we just have to be kinder to ourselves. Now, to, to be persons of present and future, which we can take a hold on. No? And not to think that the what we're learning now is so we can judge how we were in the past. One other thing that helps us grow in freedom is to be positive through gratitude. So all of us should after the COVID-19 pandemic. If you look at every part of the litany, if you look at every part of the litany, there are the negative things. The fragility of life, isolation that sickness had imposed on us, being anxious and distressed, depressed and lonely and impatient during this time of COVID-19. Parang, parang nanunumbat kay Lord. <laughs> but for every um for every negative event no there's something to be grateful for uh, that we have been shielded that we've our minds have been open to what is really essential that we learn to connect with one another with faith and life that people practiced heroic kindness that medicine and vaccines were discovered and we experienced the assuring presence of God. And these are things that we thank God for. Um, there's no separation between what's negative and positive. It's like everything we thank God for. And, and we end this, this litany, we say, Loving God, no thought of ours is unknown to you. No tear we shed is unimportant to you. No joy we celebrate is alien to you. You entered our world of sickness, suffering, and death, and you know the fears we face. So during the time of the pandemic, we have the freedom to go beyond um, these difficulties 
and um, see God's grace and see our um, capabilities of overcoming these difficulties. To have the freedom to do good and to desire the good. So I, I share here a quote from the encyclical Spesalvi in 2007 by Pope Benedict XVI. Pope Benedict XVI was talking about incremental progress in the material sphere. And that progress in the material sphere, um, they add on, they accumulate. No? Um, there's continuous progress and ever greater mastery of the world and of nature. But this is what he said. Yet, in the field of ethical awareness and moral decision-making, there's no similar possibility of accumulation for the simple reason that man's freedom is always new and he, was, he must always make his decisions anew. These decisions can never simply be made for us in advance by others. If that were the case, we would no longer be free. Freedom presupposes that in fundamental decisions, every person and every generation is a new beginning. Of course, um, the, the Pope, um, Pope Benedict XVI, acknowledged what the new generations can learn from the old. Uh, naturally, new generations can build on the knowledge and experience of those who went before. But they can draw upon the moral treasury of the whole of humanity. See, but they can also reject that. So it's the role of, the, of each person in the generation to claim freedom for themselves. And we can't do it for them. In that sense, how we realize that freedom is fragile. Let me end this second section on uh, growing freedom for us adults. On a positive note, J.D. Salinger, his novel, Catcher in the Rye, was a standard in high school literature classes. And it was the dream of the protagonist, Holden Caulfield, to catch children so they don't fall off the cliff. It's like, so that they won't lose their innocence. Uh, J.D. Salinger has another character in his novel, Race high the roof beam carpenters. What I think is a very charming way of looking at children. Said that we can raise raise their children honorably, lovingly, and with detachment. This is the part I like most. A child is a guest in the house. Not that the child is so entitled, but that we know that our children are not our children. So a, a, a child is a guest in the house to be loved and respected, never possessed, since he belongs to God. Say how wonderful, how sane, how beautifully difficult, and therefore true, the joy of responsibility for the first time in my life.